All right, welcome everyone. It is January 12th, 2023, and the time is 6 p.m. This is a community development meeting. It is a reconsideration hearing. I'm calling this meeting to order. In attendance are Commissioners Brooks, Matari, and Duncan. Are there any changes to the agenda? All right, hearing none, I will poll for conflict of interest. None? None. None. All right, so we'll get right into our public hearing action item. We do have a couple housekeeping um, issues that I want to bring up. And um, one of them is uh, code of conduct. So I have three rules as I am in charge of uh, this meeting this evening. And number one is be respectful. Also, if someone has said exactly what you plan to say, then when I call your name, you can just say, already stated. Okay, that way we can get through as many people tonight as possible. Our goal is to get through everybody who wants to speak tonight. And anybody who has already submitted written comments, we have those, and we will be reading through them if we haven't already before the deliberations. So no cheering, jeering, or clapping. That disrupts the due process, but I would like to know if you do agree with what is being said. So if you could just show hands, that would be helpful to the board to see that you are in agreement with what is being said, okay? We wanna hear from everyone and only with no disruptions are we gonna be able to do this. So the third is please address the issues and address the Board of County Commissioners. Do not address the applicant or any other audience members, okay? And if you're waiting online, please mute your phone. Yes, and okay, <laughs> I think Dave took care of that. So um, I do wanna talk a little bit about um, this form that was filled out. Because this is not just a straight public hearing, this is a reconsideration which our uh, attorney is going to um, give us the information that it was gonna be helpful to explain it. Um, it does say applicant, and I think it might have, should have said appellant. And so that's two A words, gets confused. So you may hear me mix them up a little bit, but I'll try to correct myself so we understand uh, what is going on. Deliberations will not take place tonight. So we'll just end the public hearing and then we will continue deliberations to January 26th at 10 a.m. in this room. It will be on YouTube, so you will be able to watch. And that will be the spectator sport where we will not take any more public comment. Tonight is the participatory sport, so you all get to participate. Pat, I think it's your turn. Hi, I'm Pat Braden. I am a civil deputy prosecuting attorney for Kootenai County. Can everybody in the back hear him? Okay, is okay. your microphone I can on? speak louder. Good. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm Pat Braden. I am a civil deputy prosecuting attorney for Kootenai County. Um, and uh, we have a new commissioner. Welcome aboard, Commissioner Matari. Wanted to put that on the record. Um, there are a few things I wanted to go over. Real quick, actually three areas. Um, uh, on my advice, the county is going to be neutral in this hearing. I'm not going to argue for or against the prior decision. Um, but there are three things I want to go through. One is procedure. I sent an email out to uh, legal counsel. Um, and uh, both Mr. Leonard and Mr. Semenko have acknowledged receipt of that. Uh, I sent it to Ginny Tate and uh, one other recipient as well. Um, we will, after this, the introduction uh, by myself and by uh, Mr. Finkel, who will come up and give a quick overview of the case, um, we will allot, allot 45 minutes total to the appellants, 15 minutes apiece. Um, any time that any of the opponents go over that, that is within the discretion of the chair to allow or not allow. After the appellants go, then everybody, all the members of the public who agree with their position, the, the appellant's position, will be allowed three minutes each to speak. After they are done, then the applicant slash respondent in this uh, procedure, proceeding, will be allotted 30 minutes to speak and present evidence as, as um, 
as they desire. And then any members of the public who support the applicants slash respondents position will be able to speak. And they will have three minutes each to speak. After that, we will wrap up by allowing 15 minutes for rebuttal. That is a total of 15 minutes, which can be allocate the uh, appellants can allocate amongst themselves as they as they may see fit but it's just it's a total of 15 minutes and then it will come to the board to decide uh, what to do and I would uh, I would expect that you would there would be a motion to uh, end public testimony at the, that time and <coughs> continue the matter for deliberations to the 26th at 10 a.m. the second thing is uh, just a brief statement of the legal standard that applies under state law. The uh, Kootenai County Code regarding requests for reconsideration, section 88502, states a request for reconsideration shall be limited to the grounds set forth in 60 sec section 6765.35 Idaho Code. So if you go to section 6765.35, Uh, subsection 2 states that um, failure to, I section 2A says failure to identify the nature of compliance or non-compliance with express approval standards or failure to explain compliance or non-compliance with relevant decision criteria shall be grounds for invalidation of an approved permit or site specific authorization or the denial of the same on appeal. So those Basically, whether the board complied with express approval standards and whether the board complied with the relevant decision criteria are the two criteria that will determine whether, um, whether the decision should be changed on reconsideration. The board has the ability to affirm the decision it previously made, reverse the pre previous decision it made, and deny the application affirm the decision that was previously made but with modifications or it can, it can vacate the decision and remand the matter to either the hearing examiner or community development staff as it may um, as it may see fit the third thing I want to go through is just a couple of um, considerations from the federal telecommunications act that apply most of the time when we have these hearings these are strictly matters of state law and, and the county land use and development code. However, when it comes to uh, telecommunications towers, such as is the subject of this matter, the Federal Telecommunications Act also applies. It says that uh, in Section 47 U.S.C. Section 253A, no state or local statute or regulation or the other state or local legal requirement may prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting the ability of any entity to provide any interstate or intrastate telecommunications service. Now, there, there are, are cases, particularly in the Ninth Circuit, which are binding in Idaho, uh, even if they arise out of other states within the circuit, that clarify that, it ha that there has to be an actual um, prohibition or effective prohibition demonstrated uh, that it is not enough to merely demonstrate the possibility of prohibition of an entity to provide telecommunications service. The other main, can, oh, and it also requires uh, decisions to be in writing separate from the, re the, re the remainder of the record and the proceedings, very similar to Idaho Code Section 67, 65, 35. Um, so basically, as long as we com uh, comply with the state statute, we also comply with the federal on that regard. One, one last thing is that under FCC regulations, decisions on whether to approve or deny a telecommunications tower cannot be based on the um, actual or perceived effects of radio frequency radiation on human health. Um, as long as the facility meet, is uh, within FCC parameters in, in terms of that, uh, the uh, radio frequency radiation that it emits. 
And so that that's it for my part of it, unless there are any questions from the board. <coughs> questions for Pat? No, no questions. Okay. Um, thank you, Pat. Um, David, are you able to mute that, or is it someone else? Madam Chair, the uh, problem is people keep coming into Zoom, and they're automatically not muted. Okay. So I'm sort of frantically muting them as we go. Okay. Um, but I, if you hear that sort of note, that's what's going on. Okay. And then do you have anything, or are we going to jump right into Vlad? I think everything's been covered at this point. Vlad has a few things to say, and then we're, our part of it's done. All right. And I would advise Mr. Finkel to remain neutral in his presentation. Good evening, Commissioners. For the record, Vlad Finkel with Kootenai County Community Development. I'll be very brief in my uh, introduction presentation unless one of the Commissioners has uh, project-specific questions for me. Uh, this request, case number CUP 22-0004, for a wireless communication facility at the request of Mr. Engel, AT&T, and SmartLink. Then can you press on any key? Excuse me. So this is a request, as a majority of the board knows, that was submitted last uh, summer to community development for review. It is located on Potlatch Hill. It is just south um, east of city of Coeur d'Alene. However, it is also bounded by the city limits on two sides. The subject property, as I st stated, is at the top of Potlatch Hill. It consists of approximately seven acres, a little bit over seven acres, and it is uh, heavily vegetated. There is some sparse vegetation on the east side of the property. However, a majority <coughs> of the site adjacent to Potlatch Hill Road is heavily vegetated at this time. The subject property is zoned agricultural suburban, and it has a border comp plan designation. It is located within the city of Coeur d'Alene area of city impact. Uh, based on previous testimony by staff, um, we advise the board that this application was submitted to the city of Coeur d'Alene based on the city of Coeur d'Alene ACI agreement for their review. They were given an opportunity of 30 days to comment, which in response they did not raise any issues uh, during the original review process. Uh, we did look at the surrounding zoning within the city limits of Coeur Lane. You have R1 as well as R3 PUD uh, on the north and east side of the subject property. The property is also um, on, the w on the west, directly to the south and to the north, is within the uh, Kootenai County unincorporated area. It's a small island. Uh, this is the site plan that was submitted by the applicant with the original request with the location of the pro proposed tower close to the uh, location of Potlatch Hill Road with the proposed improvements um, on the west portion of the property with the driveway and then the area where the cell tower will be placed. Uh, it, it will be a 150-foot tall lattice tower with a 5-foot lightning rod we did explain to the board that the lightning rod is an appurtenance to the tower itself. Therefore, it is um, allowed to be at the top of the proposed cell tower and that the limitations on a 150-foot height would not have, um, would not be uh, directly uh, related to the um, antenna, or I'm sorry, the lightning rod being placed at the top of the cell tower. Just to give you some course of proceedings, the application was submitted on June 15th, 2022, and deemed to be complete and sufficient. Uh, based on the federal shot clock, 
there is a limitation on the amount of time that any jurisdiction has to review an application. Otherwise, it is deemed to be automatically approved. If I'm in, am inaccurate in my assessment, I'd like to have uh, our deputy prosecuting attorney um, clarify it in that regard. So we were bound by some federal regulations in terms of the limits on the review of this application. It was later determined by our legal counsel that the um, request for reconsideration beyond the initial decision by the Board of County Commissioners would not be subject to the limitations by the federal regulations. The hearing examiner heard this request in September and subsequently recommended denial. On October 27th of last year, the Board of County Commissioners approved the request. Subsequent to the approval of the conditional use permit, we received a total of three requests for reconsideration. Two were submitted on November 8th, and then an additional one was submitted on um, November 10th. Pursuant to uh, Kootenai County Land Use and Development Code, the board cannot deny a request for reconsideration. Uh, we did advise the board uh, immediately after the requests were received that um, we have a reconsideration request that will be coming forward um, at a later date. Since then, we had notice for a public hearing at the end of last month to be uh, exact uh, December 29th. However, due to um, the appellant's inability to be present at the hearing, it has been po postponed to tonight's uh, hearing date. I don't necessarily have any additional questions. I'd like to point out that while we don't have a new staff report um, to present to you because the conditions of the applications or the sideboards have not changed, we did tally the um, public comments that were received with respect to the uh, reconsideration hearing for tonight. We did receive a total of uh, we, we received a total of 55 comments in support of the appellant for the reversal of this request, and we received a total of five comments on opposition of a, the appellant's request. Um, the concerns that were raised in the latest comments are very similar to those uh, that were previously uh, presented at the two hearings before the hearing examiner as well as the board. Uh, they are stemming from aesthetics, obstruction of use, potential increase of fire risk, health concerns, negative impact of wildlife, limited escape routes, um, existing uh, potlatch hill road conditions, and as well as the latest uh, concern that was brought up by the uh, appellants was the fact that the uh, setback uh, setbacks for the proposed wireless communication facility were not uh, compliant with the prescribed setbacks in the land use development code. And the last one was the decrease in property values should this application uh, be affirmed. I can address any questions that you have at this time, but this is kind of the limit, limited scope of my introduction at this time. Okay. Any questions for Vlad? No questions. All right. Thank you, Vlad. All right. Out of our three appellants, who is going to go first? Uh, good evening, Commissioners. My name is Norm Simanko. I'm uh, an attorney with the firm of Parsons, Bailey, and Latimer. I spent about half my time here and half my time in Boise. Uh, I represent the appellants uh, on the letter that we submitted November 10th, uh, 47 uh, appellants. One of those is sitting up here with me is Alyssa Sanchek, and she's going to provide part of our 15-minute uh, presentation. Um, in full disclosure, um, I grew up here. I graduated from Lakeland High School. I've never really completely left the area. Uh, my uncle and aunt, my other aunt, live here in Coeur d'Alene and Spirit Lake. Uh, our daughter lives here. Our new granddaughter, 16 months old. Harper lives here. Um, I did get to spend some time with her this afternoon. 
told her I have to go to the hearing. They tried to get me to do it by Zoom, but you know, <laughs> that's, that's not really working, right? So I'm here. Uh, the other thing I wanted to disclose um, is that uh, my son-in-law is a uh, felony prosecutor for the county. Um, we've never discussed this matter. He doesn't have anything to do with this matter, but I feel like I should at least um, disclose that. So um, right from the get-go on the matter of, of conflicts of interest, I do want to mention uh, one of the things that's in our uh, petition, our request for reconsideration, uh, and that was um, the concern about uh, then-Chairman Filios's previous employment with AT&T. And it's not clear from the record whether that was a true employer-employee relationship or not. Our concern, of course, is that if there's any relationship with the applicant or someone interested in the application, it would have been nice for that to be disclosed on the record and to ascertain whether there was a conflict of interest. There's two potential concerns there. Of course, one is under the Local Land Use Planning Act itself, if you have a pecuniary or economic interest in the outcome of the matter, which to me, having been a former city councilman for five years, uh, do you have an interest in the actual matter in front of the commission? And I don't know what the answer to that would have been um, because it wasn't disclosed. Um, but the other one that's of concern, and we recently ran into this issue I did in Bonner County and had a matter voluntarily remanded because of it. Um, if the uh, commissioner is receiving any kind of pecuniary benefit or has received any kind of pecuniary benefit, economic benefit, from the applicant or anyone interested in the matter, and I'm not talking about a bribe. We don't know if Mr. Filios had retirement benefits, a pension. We have no idea what his relationship with his with AT&T. <clears throat> and I mention that because Mr. Braden mentioned the standards uh, that these kinds of cases are reviewed under state law, and one of them is whether the right procedure and process was followed by the commission. Now, we're here in a, in a reconsideration. It's a de novo proceeding. But I, I did want to at least mention that the proper way to deal with that is to recuse yourself. If you don't recuse yourself, um, it, it taints the decision, and it should be set aside. And th this is training from the uh, Idaho Association of Counties, by the way, that when you participate in a decision like this, you should recuse yourself. If you don't recuse yourself, the decision should be set aside. That is what happened in the Bonner County matter. It was set aside. Um, but I do want to mention that because we, we did put that in our request for reconsideration. So we are here tonight to ask you to reverse the previous decision of the county commissioners and to deny the application for a conditional use permit. Uh, Mr. Braden uh, mentioned the Federal Telecommunications Act and spoiler alert, that's the big issue here tonight. There are a number of reasons why you can and you will hear about why you should deny this application under your code. But the most important part of your code is the one that talks about needing to demonstrate the need for the facility. In the parlance of the Federal Communications Act case law, is there a significant gap in coverage that needs to be filled? What you need to understand is, let's say you deny this because you agree on the setback issue, or pick your issue, whatever it is, you deny it. Applicant can go to federal court and say, there's an effective prohibition here because there's a significant gap in coverage. We demonstrated this is the only way to serve it, and it must be granted. It's preempted under federal law. It doesn't matter if the other provisions of county code weren't met. So spoiler alert, this is the most important issue. In our view, the applicant has failed to provide probative evidence that proves that a significant gap in telecommunication service exists in the target area served by the proposed tower. You are bound by, and Mr. Braden mentioned, the Ninth Circuit ruling definitions of quote-unquote significant gap in telecommunications coverage and quote-unquote least intrusive means to close any proven significant gap. There are at least three important cases that uh, we mentioned in our materials. We want to ask you to take notice of those. The Metro PCS versus San Francisco case is 400 Federal 3rd 715. Sprint Telephony PCS versus County of San Diego is 543 Fed 3rd 571. And T-Mobile USA Inc. versus City of Anacortes is 572 Fed 3rd 987. 
The definition of significant gap from the federal cases does not include in building coverage or in vehicle coverage. So in other words, the preemption issue doesn't apply to cases where we're trying to increase coverage in a building or in a vehicle. That's not part of the definition of a significant gap in coverage. It only applies to quote unquote personal wireless service. That's wireless telecommunication services, outdoor wireless phone calls as clarified in that Ninth Circuit case law. And interestingly, if you look at a lot of ATT's own coverage maps, it says this map displays approximate outdoor coverage. Actual coverage may vary. Coverage isn't guaranteed and is subject to change without notice. You must reject all attempts to broaden the narrow definition of significant gap in telecommunications coverage to include in building or in vehicle coverage, which do not appear in these rulings. The latest 12 months of anonymous call records for all calls attempted in the target area is probative evidence, which would help answer the relevant question. What are the percentage of dropped calls actually occurring? The applicant failed to provide any such evidence and has not proven that a significant gap exists. The projections offered are just that, projections. The projections are not based on any data, no data that's been submitted to you, that customers cannot make wireless phone calls outdoor via wireless telecommunication services. The applicant has had months to submit probative evidence. The projections they offered are not based on actual verifiable call record data and therefore do not meet the standard of probative evidence in federal court. The hearing examiner pointed this out. AT&T could have brought, the applicant could have brought evidence after that. Didn't bring the data, the hard data. One common form of data is drive test data. To get drive test data, a consultant can take a recording device, attach it to a phone, and drive through the area. That recording device gives you actual signal strength throughout the jurisdiction. That data would be actual probative data to determine the existence or absence of significant gaps in service and the geographic locations of those gaps with GPS coordinates. You do have data. The only data you have of signal of coverage in the target area is from local residents. And they show no gap. And I'm going to have Melissa talk about that. We do have an exhibit we'd like to okay. enter in. We may not have enough copies. We did provide one for the applicant. I need to put it. Um, so I'll try to do this on the computer. Um, Alyssa DeSonsic, I live at 965 North Armstrong Drive up on Potlatch Hill. Um, everything that you see in this packet it has been submitted previously. What I did was I refined it and edited just a little bit so that it would fit in a smaller space. <laughs> um, if you look at page six, this is what Mr. Sameko has been um, discussing. The evidence that we provided um, comes in two parts. So on page six, what you see is a map um, and some screenshots from my phone. Uh, I went for a few hours around the area and I have an AT&T phone. I can show you all of my bills for the past 14 years from AT&T to prove that it actually is an AT&T phone. Um, what I did was I drove around and took screenshots on my phone of the coverage that was being offered um, in each one of those areas in my car with my windows up. Um, I, you'll see a few of those images there have three bars um, in the areas that are further outside of town, um, but the majority of them, including every single one in town, shows complete coverage, four bar coverage, um, and those can be repeated on anybody's phone. Uh, I also attempted at many of those locations, not all, but many to play videos from YouTube. They played every single spot. Um, and then the other aspect of this that we brought up before, but I'd like to draw your attention to is, um, if you skip down to page 10, 
Beginning on page 10, what we show is the AT&T presentation from both hearings, um, each one of their slides. Um, starting on page 10, of um, what I did was I just put an, a, an approximate location for each one of the alternative towers that they said that they might be able to use as a co-location tower, existing towers in the area. Um, as opposed to putting a new tower up on Potlatch Hill. Moving down to page 11, what I did was I showed their slides, are the top two. Um, moving down to the bottom two on page 11, what I did was I covered up the agreed upon already existing coverage area, which they pointed out, and the lake, which can't be used um, legally to justify needing additional coverage or that there's a gap. So I covered those up in black. Moving down to the next two pages, what you see is the suggested Potlatch Hill tower location minus the coverage that already exists and the, and the lake. And what I did was I pulled out the new coverage that would be provided by that tower. I did the same thing for alternative tower site number two and then on the next page, number four and number six. And you can see to the right-hand side of the page, each one of those different um, white and blue pictures is the additional coverage that would be provided by each one of those additional towers, or alternative towers, excuse me. When you move down to the next page, page 14, what you see is all of those new coverage maps in comparison. I mix them up, and I'm not saying which one is which. And I don't think that it really matters. Because if you look at all four of those, it just shows that AT&T could use any of those co-location towers to provide the additional signal that they need as compared to putting a new tower up on Potlatch Hill. It's exactly the same, precisely the same. So um, considering both of those things, uh, both the uh, lack of a significant gap in coverage, in fact, not a gap in coverage at all in the entire area, um, and the fact that they have alternatives that they've pointed out to us that would provide the exact same coverage in addition to what's already there, um, I think that that it just goes a long way to sort of reinforce what Norman was talking about, that what it comes down to is, is this. A okay. minute and a half. Thanks, Melissa. So even if, and, and obviously with the data that she's provided, it's not necessary. There's not a significant gap in coverage. But even if there is a significant <coughs> gap in coverage, it also has to be shown that it's the least intrusive means available. Uh, Mr. Braden mentioned the Telecommunications Act. An important part of that says, in general authority, except as provided in this paragraph, and that's what he referred to, the act shall not limit the authority of local governments over decision-making regarding placement, construction, and modification of these kinds of facilities. That's about alternative locations. And you saw alternative locations can provide basically identical coverage. So not a significant gap, hasn't been proven, no data, no data. Ada County just recently rejected a very similar application. Propagation maps, testimony, experts, all that stuff, but no data. Talked about the data, why the data wasn't there, why they didn't submit it, or if they even had it. It was denied because the data wasn't submitted. Their code doesn't even talk about submitting data. Your code talks about submitting data. That's what the hearing examiner was saying, the data wasn't submitted. So on those two points under federal law, um, and I'll be back to talk to you uh, uh, on rebuttal. We believe that this should be denied. Um, and if this was in court, it would be denied. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next. Stephen Petrosky, appellant number two. I live at 3114 West Pascal Drive in Coeur d'Alene. My property I own on Potlatch Hill, 3119 East Sky Harbor Drive. 
my summary that I'm going to put before I read my letter is I'm going to talk about setbacks. And to clarify setbacks, it's the distance away from something. So if we're talking about a house, for example, when we're building on a lot, there's X amount of feet away from a property line on all sides. So that's where I'm going with this. Please reconsider your approval of CUP 22-004. After reviewing the Kootenai County Code on WCF 8.5.132 wireless communication facilities, the WCF does not have enough setback to be placed on Mr. Engel's lot. It would be non-compliant. AT&T's plans took setback measurements per the site plan provided to all of us from the center of the tower and not the siting area as defined in the Kootenai County Code. Also worth mentioning, the county, by code, requires a landscape design plan by a landscape design professional. This was not included in the application. I'll first define the WCF code 8.9503. Note the siting area that I mentioned in here. Wireless communication facility. Any facility designed and used for the purpose of transmitting receiving and relaying voice and data signals. The WCFs included siting area, transmission towers, and antennas. This definition shall not include towers less than 20 feet in height that are mounted upon another structure or facilities that towers are less than 40 feet in height above the natural ground. A public safety wireless communication facility is a WCF that is owned by a public entity which provides emergency communications, 911, fire, law enforcement, emergency medical services, or emergency management services, and is used for more than one of those purposes. Code 8.9501, transmission tower. A tower such as a self-supporting lattice, monopole structure, or other similar constructions which elevates a wireless communication antenna and may also include accessory transmission and receiving equipment. Now we're getting closer to the setbacks. I promise, playing you in with there. All WCFs shall be set at least 300 feet from existing residential structures. All WCFs shall be set back at least 150 feet from the boundary of any parcel located within the agricultural, suburban, restricted residential, or high density residential zone. Vlad did show us the map on the screen. Second, I will define the siting area mentioned above, code 8.9.403. Siting area. That portion of a parcel that contains the transmission tower, related buildings, and equipment required for the operation of a wireless communication facility. To further address the siting area, a fence must be constructed around the siting area, per code 8.5.132. Landscape. A landscape plan shall design plan prepared by a landscape design professional. So this is where they kind of tie together. I'll keep reading the code. Existing vegetation at the tower site shall be preserved at the maximum extent possible. Landscaping shall be placed completely around the site, except as required to access the facility. Landscaping shall be compatible with the other nearby landscaping and shall be kept healthy and well maintained. And here's the part I was hitting on. A chain link fence, no less than six feet in height from the finished grade shall be constructed around the siting area. Access shall be locked, be by a locked gate. Per AT&T's plan that was provided for the site plan, a 70 by 70 siting area is drawn on their plan. Measurements were not taken from the fence that surrounds the siting area. Hence, the WFC does not have enough setback on the lot. The current measurements were based on the center of the tower. There were a couple comments I wanted to make separate from the code and the setbacks. The city of Coeur d'Alene didn't allow the citizens to comment on the tower. The engineer replied no comment and sent it back. I took the time to talk to Gerald Archer. He said to me, the road doesn't meet fire code. In some spots, it's 17 feet wide or less, and he can't apply the code book until the building permit. Eastside Highway District, Ben Weymouth, the Highway District Director, can't ask for improvements up front, but acknowledges neglect on the road. 
He noted no traffic plan was in place for the application from AT&T, being it's a single lane road, how do we offload those trucks without interrupting current traffic flow? Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Tate. Thank you. I'm at, uh, appellant number three, Virginia Tate, 4176 East Potlatch Hill Road, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And thank you for having me here tonight. I do have an exhibit, and uh, I sent some pictures to Vlad, and I apologize for them being a little wonky. We were uh, not anticipating uh, to speak tonight, or our attorney was unable to be here. So I do have some exhibits, and I'm afraid I am one short. Madam Clerk, could you state the exhibit number of both this exhibit and the previous exhibit? The previous exhibit was B1001, and this one will be B1002. All right. Thank you so much for having us here tonight and um, uh, allowing us a reconsideration. I, I would like to start out with the sheriff himself sent a message saying this is a project he is opposed to. Uh, quite honestly, he can't defend it. It's on an unprotected piece of property, and it is, uh, unfortunately, with the island of a county surrounded by city, there gets to be much confusion and call. Who's supposed to respond to the call? The other thing that causes me great shock that this was, was approved at the original hearing our law enforcement agency doesn't utilize AT&T's emergency communication system. They have, in fact, rejected that and utilized a different communication system. So the argument that this is required for communication and emergency response is incorrect. I'm also shocked that in Kootenai County, AT&T, this, this, this was originally approved. I mean, we've got AT&T is like the version of Big Pharma. And, when, and the previous approval is equivalent to allowing AT&T to use big government's rules to force bad things to happen to the private residents that live adjacent to this property. I am further appalled and have mentioned many times, of course, that the failure of, of the county commissioners to protect its citizens is of great alarm to me. I have written at great length about the fact that in 1955, Eastside Highway District forced the road from the Graf Tate family and said, we are going to put a second way out over the side, down the hill to Silver Beach. That never happened. The freeway was raised, and it can now not happen. They further, as, as Stephen Petrosky mentioned, have said that they can't comment on the fact that fire and he said highway district will require additional pieces until the building permits have been set in. So to go ahead under the premise that everything's okie dokie by the fire department and by he said highway district is be living in a fool's world. Stephen Petrosky and myself have spent numerous hours trying to resolve the issue of that road that was promised in 1955 to be maintained to code. It is not maintained to code. I can assure you that I myself have to go out and fill in the potholes. I myself have to go out and plow the road. I myself have to go out and put sand on the road because it is so slippery. I myself have to go out and tow people out of the ditch when it snows. So there is a lack of maintenance at the county, and I feel that this has been overlooked completely. There are a couple other points that I would like to hit. Of course, I don't want to bombard you with, with things that you've heard before. But I do, uh, I want to add, and this was in my letter, this tower is drilling into solid basalt. I know this because I put a well in. And the well reports also notice that, 
there's just a small layer of, of, of dirt, and then we hit solid basalt. And they're going to have to blast this basalt to be able to set this flat 70 by 70 tower. There's no way around it. They're going to have to cut down a lot of trees. There's no way to disguise that this thing, it, I'm going to stand up at my front door, and I'm going to look out, and I'm going to see the base of this tower. There is no way to avoid any access to that, and I'm, that I'm not going to see it. That goes for all my other neighbors on the road. Another issue that was brought up that is of concern to me is that somehow, in the record, it was overlooked. We brought three RF engineers to speak at the two prior public hearings, and it was stated at the uh, initial consideration hearing uh, by the commissioners that no one brought an RF engineer. We, in fact, did bring an RF engineer that says you cannot ground into basalt. Basalt is not, it's not going to conduct and drop that. So I feel like this has been failed really to be looked at. I know there's a lot of data to go through. And certainly, those of us that have lived on this road uh, for the last 110 years that my family has, and including Mr. Ingalls, are well aware of those issues. I want again to hit that wildfire is the number one concern of the governor. And that's going to be important as we go further down into my presentation. But in fact, the governor did have a meeting here hosted by the resort. Uh, and he had all the governors across the western United States to meet in Coeur d'Alene regarding this. Our RF engineer, along with two other RF engineers that live within the impact of this, stated that lightning is an issue with this. They will not be able to ground it. The piece that has been overlooked, an antenna is, is a wonderful thing, and I appreciate the fact they want to put an antenna there, but that antenna is to protect the equipment installed by at and It's not there. It is there to deflect the lightning. It's going to deflect the lightning right out to the next tallest thing, which will be a tree. It'll be a tree that catches fire and runs up the hill. And I will continue that that, that is of interest. Um, Vlad, if you could put up those, those pictures, I think this will help explain this. And while he's doing that, I do want to note there is a secondary issue that you have not uh, been aware of before, although I've tried to bring it into play, and it hits with uh, the setbacks that Stephen Petrosky discussed. Um, Vlad's looking for the pictures, and it'll show how the setbacks really truly hit where we're planning, or where the, the AT&T is proposing this project be placed. But you do have two copies of them up there. While he's looking for those, I, I have given you a copy of this forestry management plan. This is a forestry management plan. Kootenai County required me as a landowner to pay money to produce, to make sure that I could qualify to lower fire risk by having my land maintained in the agricultural grant which Kootenai County administered. I had to spend a lot of time with this. One of the things that I particularly, as you get a chance to look through it, it's, it's several pages long, it talks about the wildlife, it talks about water to the area, which is a big problem. The closest fire hydrant is over at a long way down the street on the paved road. It is, they cannot utilize that fire hydrant to put out a fire. It's way too far, way out of the setback. I'm hoping they'll find these soon. There we go, perfect. Okay, inside my well report, on page 27, you will see a piece called the old water cistern. That's my water backup right there. It, we will we'll go to that in a minute. I want to point out 
that applicant Ingalls great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents put that in so that we had water to our homes. That is the secondary backup of water to both my house, which you see on the screen, and to the home that is owned by the applicant's sister. Because underneath the ground is a bunch of plumbing that at the well house that is located on my property, all I ought to do is turn a knob and the water goes over to the other house a house that the applicant's grandfather lived in, his great-grandmother, many of his relatives lived in. If you would go to the next slide, please, Vlad. And I'm sorry, this one's probably a little crooked. So, bear with For those of you that have a copy of it, though, you will see I have marked where the cistern is in relationship to where the setbacks are. Well, while he's digging that up, there are two copies sitting up, up at the front, and uh, I'm certainly happy to offer my copy of it. That cistern is within the 150-foot setback. It's on my side of the property line. It's on the Elk Point side. It is directly attached to my residence. That water line comes right down to my residence. So in fact, this is not only within 150 feet, the setback is 97 feet to my property line from the edge of the site. My cistern is then probably about 110 feet from the, the site. Again, hooked up to my residence that's there. I have engaged the services. Should this be approved, I have engaged the services of Northwest Groundwater Consultants. Stephen Petrosky and I have met with Northwest Groundwater Consultants, one of the principal hydrologists in the area. And he has stated that this tower is going directly on the water vein that feeds the well to my house, that feeds the well to my neighbor's house, which is the former house the applicant lived in, which also feeds the well that uh, the applicant's sister lives in, or owns, and along with the well that uh, others, there are six other homes that are fed from this well. What happens when you build one of these things? You're going to have to blast in that basalt. There's no way around it. What is that going to do? It's going to cause the veins of the water to spread. We have no guarantee that we will have any water. We have no guarantee that our septic sites will work after this because all this blasting will disrupt. Basalt rock cracks. And that is still the, there we go. You can see on the purple there's, and I'm sorry, it's not a great picture, but on the purple right there is the side of the cistern. Those yellow lines are 150 feet from the corner of the 70 foot fence. You can see that that setback, this, this proposed tower is far in to my property. It affects my water source. It affects half the room's water source. And I'm afraid somehow this got missed in, in the look at this. But it is reported as an historic water site right within my forestry plan. I have always maintained my property to reduce the uh, incidence of fire to the extent that I can. I have maintained my property so that I have noxious weeds. The applicant has never maintained his property. The hearing examiner spoke to the fact that he has never maintained the property, and yet somehow this has come into existence and we've gotten this far. But I'd be clear that where this thing is sitting, it doesn't meet the setback on three out of four of its sides. It will disturb our water. You can't give us our water back. There's not a second route to get off the hill. There is no water to fight the fire. Please, 
please, for the sake of those of us that live there and have lived there a long time, do not allow this tower to be built. Thank you. Uh, folks, thank you. Raise your hands. Thank you. Some people came in late, so I just said, please, no clapping, but if you agree with the uh, um, speaker, please raise your hands. Okay, thank you. Let's see. All right, now we're ready to do uh, three minutes for uh, speakers who want to uh, speak, and I have Mary Camprath in favor wishes to speak. Hello, my name is Marie Camproth. I live on Sky Harbor Drive, just above this site. Um, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother. I'm also a real estate broker, I live on the hill. Um, this is, I understand, an opportunity for our elected representatives to represent the people, not the interests of our technocracy and our corporate interests, but rather the people, our neighbors who have water sources. Um, our residents do not want the tower for the stated health reasons. Um, it's uh, disturbing to me that the FCC has not updated since 1996. There have been no studies done by any cell phone company about the health risks of cell phone towers, and yet we can't admit that into any testimony or reasons for the tower. Though I think we have had plenty of evidence aside from that that this is not good for our system. Um, also, I have encountered buyers, and surveys have been done that show that people, 97% of people do not want to live near a cell phone tower. So that directly affects our property values as well as our health and well-being. Thank you. Ed DeYoung, in favor, wishes to speak. Hello, I'm Ed DeYoung. Uh, if you go from the South Tower site down to Fernand Lake and up Fernand Hill and then back down the hill, that's where I live. And I have no problem with cell service there, which is kind of should be a shadow of where cell service is. <clears throat> uh, also, it's interesting that the FCC doesn't allow health reasons because um, the 5G um, <clears throat> thing affects the bio biology if it's above 10 microwaves. And if you're about <clears throat> uh, two blocks away from a cell tower, it's a thousand um, microwave effects. So it's you know 100 times more than what the biology can, can hold. <clears throat> so it affects that. Uh, and that's what so if there's any questions, I can answer them, but that's what I have to say. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Joel, um, and I just, sorry, I'm butchering Please. people's names, but Balby? Hopefully I'm the only Joel. If there's another Joel, I apologize. Yeah. Balby? Yeah. In yeah. favor yeah. wishes to speak. Go right ahead, Joel. My name is Joel Bowlby. Um, I live at 940 North Armstrong Drive here in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, lived here in Coeur d'Alene my whole life. Grew up down in Fernand. I have three children who live at the current residence. And just to add something new, uh, my two concerns, which I submitted, are fire risk as well as visual proximity to the lake. To touch on fire risk, though, this is something that was new. Um, I called. I have family. We've got some property in Moscow Bay, east side. Uh, there was a storm that came through on the night of August 18th, a major lightning storm. Uh, he moved to the area on August 19th. East Lake Fire responded to smoke near the base of the cell tower above Beauty Bay. According to East Lake Fire District, the tower and the area around the tower was smoking. They admit that they're not fire inspectors, because I called them, and they said, you know, that we're not fire inspectors. And to my knowledge, no fire inspection was sent out, but they believe that the lightning hit the cell tower first and spread from there. So similar, it protected the tower, hit, moved, hit a tree, and thank goodness we got a lot of rain that night, put the fire out. I actually think they responded with their fire boat, sprayed it down. So... Uh, my concern is fire. We live above this. There's one way into this community, one way out of this community. Um, and should a fire come on, I just concern, concern about that. So thank you for your time. And, thank uh, you. All right. Melissa Bird, in favor, wishes to speak. Hello. 
Melissa Bird on East Fernand Terrace Drive. Um, just to add to what folks have mentioned about the fire danger, I'm an insurance agent, and um, this will become an issue as far as residents being able to get insurance. A lot of insurance companies aren't writing um, in this area to begin with, and increasing the fire exposure is also going to become a problem, um, either increasing rates or not being available at all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Sue Kuhn, in favor? May wish to speak? No? Okay. All right, Wayne Long, looks like, in favor, wishes to speak? Longo. Longo, sorry. Okay. I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> I've said worse. <laughs> My name is Wayne Longo. I live at 4599 Potlatch Hill Road in Coeur d'Alene. I've testified twice before and also submitted um, some comments. I'm not going to readdress those, but I do want to address the fire danger. As a 40-plus year veteran of policing, um, my goal has always been, and my officers, to serve and protect. I'm very disturbed that Kootenai Fire um, has described that area as being so dangerous, it is what it is, basically, to paraphrase. Um, that's all the more reason not to approve this request. However, um, if it's predictable, it's preventable, as you've just heard, fire is going to happen. We don't know when, but it will. None of us will, that live at the east end of the ungraveled portion of Potlatch Hill Road will get out of there alive. All I'm requesting is if you, yeah, I know you have a tough job to do. I'm very happy and thankful for your service and staff as well for your dedication to this. I understand that the, the, those stresses. Um, as chief of police, I had to provide a budget for safety equipment, including ammunition and weapons for my officers. Unfortunately, that's the world that we live in. The ammunition that firefighters need is water. There is no water up there. Um, as with the Tates, we have six people on our well. Knock on wood, it's a good well, but it takes a lot of money, a lot of effort to keep it going. I'm concerned about that. But even if that water water stay in place, it would not be enough for Kootenai Fire um, to save us, let alone protect them. Their ammunition is fire. So I ask you that you consider that as you're deliberating. I know it's a tough decision to make, but think of the people. Um, we live there. I've lived there for 30 years. My wife has lived there for over 60 years. Um, it is a concern to us. Thank you for your time and your service. Thank you. Madam Chairman? Yes. yes. I'm having problems with Zoom. I've lost connection twice. Okay. Could we take a few minute res uh, recess while I work with Jonathan, make sure we're actually still connected to the network? My computer says I'm not. All right. Um, how about we reconvene at 710? Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So. Um, all right, so I've got my opposed right here. I've got a couple neutrals. Here's, here's so some okay. Oh, yeah. Maybe go get a couple more mints. So, mints will help with the I don't I, they're going to bombard the bathroom. Are you not there? They don't know about that flavor. Um, a if we lose Zoom, we have to do this over again. Really? Yep. Yep. Maybe there's a denial of service attack being done by the recorders. Yes, can I help you? I do. Okay. Not check, but if you want to ask. Yep, yep, I will. I usually put those in the wish to speak and then I um, okay. do that. Oh, all right. And let's see, the, the speak and no speak for the opposed? Sure. And you can put them in one pile, just put the no speak behind. Okay, so these are all in favor, do not wish to speak. Yes. Okay. 
These are the proposed. I'm going to step out just for yes, a second. Yes, absolutely. Okay, yep. Well, my goal is to be done. Hopefully we're done by then, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I think the first clapping was because people came late. The first clapping was because people came late. Yeah. Uh, for your quick return, and I really appreciate the uh, hand gestures and that they are using all five fingers. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, we'll go ahead on with our uh, testimony, and uh, I'm sorry, Carlene Carson? Is that, I don't know, it's, it's yeah, there you go. I'll go with that, um, yes, and in favor and wishes to speak. Oh, is the microphone on? Sorry. I'm very familiar with this type of issue. I fought this in another city. I formed a group of people and we successfully stopped a tower that was interestingly going to be put sandwiched between um, a children's school and a preschool. And what was interesting just to, to note was that the reason it was being um, proposed in that area was because anywhere else to the west of it on a hilltop was EPA land and it wasn't allowed on EPA land so the irony is is I, I know we all know the elephant in the room is that we can't fight this based on safety because of a ludicrous 1996 telecommunications act um, but ironically if it was when it's EPA land it's a different story then safety does come into play um, and the protection of wildlife so um, my understanding is, is that there was a landmark case with Robert Kennedy in August of 2021 where the FCC actually have been asked to revise their guidelines because they are woefully out of date and they were formed at a time when smartphones didn't even exist. Um, so although I know that the focus of today and I understand why the focus of today is not to fight it on safety, um, I, and, and that other areas need to be put into the foreground, nevertheless, I still think that we have to, at some point, understand how everything is a conflict here. It, in my experience, there's always a conflict of interest. And what I'm wondering is, were all the key stakeholders completely aware of this proposal when the first um, initial um, proposal was um, granted? And I don't know the answer to that. Obviously, you do. But I know in our instance, generally the timing of when it comes out and the key stakeholders being informed sufficiently enough for people to rally and voice their concerns wasn't the case. So um, it sounds as though there's quite a lot of people here today who who do want to have an opportunity to voice those concerns. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. All right. 
Marcy Coulter in favor wishes to speak. Good evening. Um, my name is Marcy Coulter. I live with my husband and his sons at 4702 East Potlatch Hill Road. I'm opposed to the plan of the tower, and it would be built directly above our house, which is the last of the 10 houses on this narrow, dead-end dirt road. As you already know, these massive towers are well known to attract lightning strikes, which in turn set off fires. A forest fire can devour hillside homes like ours and take lives at an exceptionally high rate of speed. Fire travels uphill more quickly than on level land. Our homes are especially vulnerable to this fire danger, as the Kootenai Fire Department is also deemed our road inadequate for an escape situation. Our request is that you deny permission to build the tower due to many factors, but the most important may be the massive fire hazard it will propose to us and our neighbors on Potlatch Hill Road. We're just a small community of 10 houses on this unimproved, one-lane, forested, dead-end dirt road that sits just below the proposed tower. We have no source of water other than small wells. The closest fire hydrant is three-quarter mile away. We and four other homes share just one small well, and it can empty quickly when our homes are just in normal, everyday use. It could never be used for fighting fires. Our well and small water tank sit within the tower buffer zone and could be damaged by blasting of rock needed to prepare the site. So who would be responsible for any damage done to us? Um, and then there's the added factor of the inaccessibility for firefighters because Kootenai Fire Department says a fire truck cannot make the sharp angled uphill turn from the paved road onto our potlatch hill dirt road. We've been told we would have just 10 minutes to reach safety in a wildfire situation and no firefighting help likely. This is a very real scenario as two years ago in the windstorm, we were trapped for five days in our homes uh, with no power and no water. We had to chainsaw ourselves out through the fallen trees over down power lines on our dirt road to get out to the paved road. So with poor access to escape, all of our Potlatch Hill and Armstrong Park homes lives could be wiped out in a lightning strike wildfire. To build a tower here only adds this already fatal scenario. For the small monthly rental fee, the landowner who does not live in Idaho will receive by allowing a giant tower to be built on this property, it seems potentially a huge price for us and the hundreds of people above us in Armstrong Park to pay as they also only have one exit road. So this opportunistic proposal is not in the best interest of our community at all, we feel. So I'm hoping that you would inspect the area personally, see that little road, consider all the homeowners affected, and I truly hope you review all the pertinent information. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Izette Motola, all right, in favor, wishes to speak. Hi, good evening. Uh, uh, I'm Izet Motola. I live in 957 Armstrong Drive with my wife, Katrina. Uh, we have been, this is kind of the fourth meeting going on, and uh, a lot of similar issues coming back. And one of the biggest issues was the uh, how the, for me, the Department of Planning and Development handled this case. And there were several issues. One of them was the soils, hydrology, fire, and what we saw is the people, the department has failed. They totally failed, they did more investigation, they didn't do more do diligent. Uh, I talked to Mr. Finkel regarding the soil report. He mentioned that it was done at the first hearing for a house, but there was never a soil report or geology report for this tower. So we don't know even to this date if this tower can be built. It's just a, the miss drawings presented, missed fire drawings approved. We wrote letters to the fire department. We wrote letters to the planning department. The applicant provided zero additional drawing or documentation. And also they presented a fake balloon presentation, their last presentation without datum points that nobody even knows how this thing is measured. So that is a complete disaster of 
how the government works with the people and with the commissioner office and to the end fail the people. And this is what happened. I have been doing projects last 35 years of my life and I did a lot of public projects, controversial projects, hotel projects. When there is a 99.9% disapproval of a project, I never see a commissioner sit down and say approve that project. This is almost impossible. And we saw in our eyes shot was a neighborhood that this project approved in a residential neighborhood, a cell tower with some phony data, which the, the lawyer is here to from the county. We presented it that in their drawing, applicants gives the liability to the county. They don't even take the liability. So if we all get sick, whatever reason, like yeah, if you get your Pfizer shot and you die, nobody is going to pay any money for it because they don't have liability. This is exactly the same thing for this tower. Nobody has liability in this country anymore. So it happens, shit happens to you, that's it, you're dead, I'm sorry. So this is it, you know, and they're gonna lie, and corporate lawyers, they get paid to lie. That's what they do, unfortunately. This is where we are. So we are asking for the people this time, deny their application and finish this tower business so everybody can move their life here. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Diana Sheridan did not say in favor, opposed, um, may wish to speak? I'll pass. Okay. And are you in favor or opposed? I'm in favor of reconsideration. Thank you. Oh boy, all right. Um, maybe John Whithurst? Is that okay? He's, he's no longer here. Okay. Brian Wheeler, in favor, may wish to speak? I'm okay. Most of my topics. Thank you. Virginia Longo, in favor, wish to speak? Most of the thing. My name is Virginia Longo, and I'm opposed to the tower. Most of the things that I was going to talk about have already been spoken to, but I think it's important to see a face with the comments, and I want to reinforce them. I've lived at the dead end of Potlatch Hill Road on Potlatch Hill for almost 60 years. The road from the hairpin turn on the dead end has not been improved in all that time. It's not passable for two cars in many places. We've never had a school bus because of this. The fire trucks have a difficult time turning around, resorting to backing down the road, uh, road on several occasions, which I've witnessed. The only water source we have is a well that right now at my dead end that serves five homes with the addition of a sixth in the coming year. My concerns are twofold. If the blasting is required, it may alter our only source of water for these six families. Our well is 540 feet down and required four attempts to hit water, making it a very costly endeavor. It actually costs my parents more to drill the well than to buy the property, 15 acres. I fear that blasting to build the tower may endanger our water source. This leads to my most important fear, which is fire. 5G towers are known to increase lightning strikes. At the last meeting I attended, we were told that the road and water issues were a problem before and that the tower would have a lightning run, so basically it was not their problem. They did not address the fact that while the tower itself might be protected from the lightning rod, it still acts as a lightning magnet, increasing the number of strikes around the tower. The tower will be located between our homes at the end of the road, six households, and our only route to escape off the mountain. It's direct line down and will cut us off. If there is a fire and we lose electricity, we will lose our water source as well because it's on a pump. No electricity, no water. The problem is compounded by the fact that the fire department will be unlikely to get to us. That leaves us without water or help to fight the fire. If this tire, uh, tower does get approved, I ask that AT&T be required to pay for the water and fire hydrants to be installed to the end of Potlatch Hill Road so that we have a fighting chance if a fire does occur from lightning strikes. I also ask if the installation of the tower disrupts our well that AT&T be financially responsible for providing another well or water source. If you've not done so already, Please come up to our homes to see and our road to see how inappropriate this location is for a tower. Even from an installation point of view, the road is not conducive to this plan. And you're welcome to stop in for a cup of coffee. I'm at the dead end. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Robin Shamp. 
In favor, does not say if they wish to speak. No, Robin. Okay. John, hi, this is just crazy. Camp Rath? Yeah, I'm, okay. <laughs> Did I get that right? You got it. In favor right. and wishes to speak. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having this reconsideration meeting today. Uh, I live on 3369 East Sky Harbor. My beautiful wife already spoke, and I'm really just going to say ditto to what we've heard. But I would invite you uh, to come up our road. Um, we've heard about the, the folks who are very, very close to where this tower would be on Potlatch. But drive all the way up to the top of Sky Harbor. It's, it's more than two miles from the base. That's a very long road. It's a windy road, and it's a county road. You guys do a great job keeping it plowed in the wintertime. We've got lots of gravel going down, and you keep it clear. But what if that fire comes? The fire's going to go up the hill. So drive our road. Drive all the way up to the gate. And remember, there's folks, I think, in the unincorporated part up, up through the gate, too, that need to get out. There's no other way out. So if a fire comes from this, this tower that might come in, boy, that would really be dangerous. And how are we all going to get off? I have no idea. So please reconsider. Thank you. Thank you. Heidi Bowen, in favor, wishes to speak. Hi, I'm Heidi Bohm, and I live at 2920 East Fernand Hill Road. Uh, I oppose the cell tower and the building of that for several valid reasons. Each one of their own is deserving a no vote. I'm here representing my husband and my neighbors who could not attend because of illnesses. All of us choose to live in this beautiful area and support the community in many ways, including voting and paying taxes. All of us are strongly opposed to this cell tower and have already expressed our opposition in previous public hearings, so we were surprised by the preliminary approval. It left us confused as to who you are representing, the taxpaying citizens who voted for you or the large non-Idaho company of AT&T. Because all the voices we heard at all the community forums universally do not want this structure in this proposed location. There's two key points I'd like to address, the tower footprint and the location. Point one, the property footprint is too small to meet the requirements. AT&T has come to the table as the expert in building towers, yet it seems that they're being less than candid to get what they want. Closer study reveals the footprint of the towers larger than what was allowed and they cannot meet the requirement of being 150 feet from the neighboring plots of land. This alone is a valid reason to deny this application as they are omitting supplying these key measurements to you and to us to get what they want. This omission also causes skepticism about their entire application and intentions with Coeur d'Alene. Further, it will likely result in multiple lawsuits by citizens against this approval, which will impinge on this board's reputation and incur significant unneeded legal expenses. Point two is regarding the location. There must be other suitable locations for this 5G tower. We suspect at and simply proposed this as the cheapest site to build at, as, as it's what many businesses would do. But our job is to see through that, listen to voters, and protect the special community. Potlatch Hill is the crown jewel of CDA, as is Tubbs Hill. This hill is a beautiful gift of nature to us all, and they want to stick a steel girder structure 14 stories tall right in the middle of this jewel. No private landowner would be allowed to build a 14-story home. Agreeing with Mr. Engel and at and and enabling them to violate requirements and visually pollute that natural hill is appalling to us as it would be a horrible eyesore and a scar in the view of Coeur d'Alene. It's not our job as citizens of Coeur d'Alene or your job as commissioners to give a and what they want. It's our job as partners to consider what at and wants and align it with the needs of this community. Clearly, the community does not want or need this tower. Sorry, Heidi. I have to cut you off there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Katrina Motola. In favor, may wish to speak. Okay. And Van Hargraves, in favor, may wish to speak. Hi, I'm Van Hargraves. I live at 820 North Centennial with my wife, Deborah. 
This is the third time I've spoken. I presented three scientific papers the first time, uh, which AT&T never responded to. One showed that Idaho was second only to Montana for the risk for uh, destruction of homes for wildfires. Second one showed that most wildfires in this state are caused by lightning. The third was a definitive study that looked at all of the data for the United States on cell phone towers and lightning strikes. The conclusion was that of the locales that were studied, which was the whole country basically, that um, of those plots that had more than 100 lightning strikes per, per uh, I think it was square kilometer, 98% of them were next to a cell phone tower. It was definitive. It was the only thing that matters here, and they've said nothing about it. You had somebody who came up here the first day who was a land developer, and he said, I can't believe you guys are doing this without an environmental impact statement. This is just fraud, okay? You have public health problems being presented to you scientifically, and you're ignoring them. He's ignoring them. This is just absolute fraud, okay? You are creating a public health problem with this. Everything else, lay it to the side. All you guys have to do is require uh, an environmental impact statement. That's all you have to do, okay? Uh, I did residency in Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa burnt down, okay? Uh, largely because of PG&E's negligence on fixing their towers. Paradise burnt down. How can you guys see this amount of data and not ask a question of AT&T about the cell tower data I presented? What do you think? <laughs> you think this is a joke? This is really simple. Just require an environmental impact statement. Vote it down, say you, w without negligence, and tell them they can reapply with an environmental impact statement. Everybody here has objected to the environmental impact. Now deal with that. Thanks. Thank you. All right, uh, Jeff Petrosky. In favor, does you want to speak? No, you're good. All right. Uh, Michelle, oh dear. <coughs> I'm Minier. Okay. In favor, does not wish to speak. Uh, and then if anybody changes their mind, please just holler out, okay? William Ledka, in favor, does not wish to speak. Nick Thorpe, in favor, does not wish to speak. Boris, uh, and I'm sorry about your last name, but you know who you are, Boris, in favor, does not wish to speak. Todd Minier, uh, in favor, does not wish to speak. Darlene DeYoung, in favor, does not wish to speak. Steve Boehm, in favor, does not wish to speak. And Darwin Hall, in favor, does not wish to speak. Denise um, Kennedy, maybe, in favor, does not wish to speak. Uh, Marsha Hall, in favor, does not wish to speak. Glenna Morell, in favor, does not wish to speak. Larry Morell, in favor, does not wish to speak. Eric Held, in favor, does not wish to speak. Katie Reidenauer, in favor, does not wish to speak. Do you want to change your mind? Okay, Katie, come on up. <coughs> will not take long. I'm just giving you a face, a uh, couple faces actually. Um, Katie Reidenauer, I'm 4701 East Potlatch Hill Road. I am there with my husband and my four-week-old and my 21-month-old, and we are the very last house. And so the fear of fire for me is incredibly terrifying. Um, so this is a family that you can see that um, 
will not survive if something were to happen with fire. So I just wanted to give you that. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. All right, Elizabeth Page in favor does not wish to speak. Iris Wood in favor does not wish to speak. Bill Breezy in favor does not wish to speak. Jen Noel in favor does not wish to speak. So if there's anybody who filled this out and accidentally put opposed, but you're in favor and do or do not wish to speak and you didn't hear your name, are we good? Okay. So let's go to Zoom, and let's see how many people would like to speak on Zoom. Chuck Smith has indicated by chat that he would like to speak, as well as Chris Van Adda. Chuck, why don't you unmute, unmute yourself and go ahead. Oh. Okay, can everybody hear me? Hey guys, um, my name is Chuck Schmidt, uh, 903 North Armstrong Drive. Uh, I've been following this for a little bit. Um, you know, I like to say I'm a born-again capitalist, and I'm a classic Idahoan. You know, I believe in a, in a party where everyone can shake hands and say thank you and let's do it again. Um, and I'm also classic Idaho where you should do what you want, and if things are zoned certain ways, then they're zoned that certain way. You know, however, um, <laughs> just looking at this from a logical, you know, and rational standpoint, you know, even, even if you're being a cynical realist in a situation like this, I see um, sorry, my kids in the background. Um, and seeing these things, even if it was like all these claims were even to be even remotely true, even an eight percent value on that, you know, that still causes great concern. Um, and I think, as far as trying to rationally choose a place for a cell phone tower, it has to be a really good job of probably picking the worst spot possible in Coeur d'Alene, um, especially that it's completely not needed. Um, I think the biggest uh, thing that I could see mostly out of this is being able to see a number five and a letter G in your phone and probably not even noticing the speed differences with the amenities of what you might have. So outside of the fires, outside of everything else, uh, the road's very steep. There's one way and one way out. Population is growing, and it's not a good spot. But I'm going to have to mute because my daughter's talking. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. All right. Up next would be Chris. Chris Van Atta. Chris, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Chris Van Atta, 4701 East Potlatch Hill Road. Um, my wife, Katie Radenauer, spoke uh, a little bit ago. And I think there's been some really great information put out there today, so I'm going to try to not recap much of anything except to reiterate that on a hill that has a one way in and one way out, this is the, probably the worst location. And if there's a chance of an increased fire risk, even by 1%, 2%, 3%, this is the wrong hill in the wrong neighborhood to put something in that can increase the danger. And as my wife said, it, it, it's a concern already of ours. Uh, and to, to make that a, a stronger likelihood, there probably is not a way out and survival and it's terrifying to think about. So uh, I just want to reiterate that. I also want to mention one thing that has not been mentioned tonight. I still don't know who approves the site plan. But if you go back and look at the Kootenai County Fire Department, their approval is pending and pending that that site plan fits with the residential driveway roadway requirements. It is very, very easy to look at that site plan and see that the entrance to the site is not a 90 degree angle that is at a minimum and there's other there other things on that list of things that have to be done and you're going to have a big company who could potentially start spending money because things have been approved and then they're going to have to change the site plan and things are going to become different all of a sudden there's probably be more trees removed i don't think this should be approved period uh but it doesn't take a genius to look at the site plan and see it already doesn't comply. I don't know how we've gotten this far. We have an, ins we have an insufficient uh, site plan and, and including everything else that, that's been said. So uh, I, I'm, I'm amazed we're here and uh, I, I hope you guys will reconsider. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Next up is Shauna and I'm sorry I don't have a last name. Shauna, go ahead and unmute yourself. 
Hi, my name is Shauna Lambert. I live at 847 South Bailey Court. Um, I am uh, in support of this. We do not want the cell tower. I agree with everything that everybody else said. Um, we have been to every hearing for this, and I would just very respectfully ask the commissioners to really dig into the information that has been submitted and the studies that have been submitted because I do not feel that due diligence is done um, on the majority of their parts um, with the first vote on this. So um, just would respectfully ask you to review all of that. Thank you. Next would Thank be you. Jason Lambert. Hello? Hello? Yes, Jason, go ahead, please. Hi, I, Jason Lambert. I live at 847 South Bailey Court. Um, I just wanted to say I'm in support of this, and um, I think everything has been said. Um, one thing that I want to note is that we are a uh, pretty much stay at home family. We work from home and we homeschool our children. And so um, the risk of fire is very frightening because we're there the majority of the time. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Lambert. Is there anyone else on Zoom that would like to speak? Yes, Steve Ridenauer would like to speak. Go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, um, Commissioners, my name is Steve Ridenauer. Uh, I live uh, in Post Falls, but I own uh, the parcel that is between the Van Adas and the Longos, and it's intended to build a family home uh, there as well. Um, I just wanted to offer just a, uh, an expanded perspective uh, on the issue regarding their perceived need uh, or expressed need, AT&T's expressed need to have a tower in this location because it's the best location from purely a service standpoint. And, and I just want to offer that I think that's, uh, that's somewhat disingenuous. And, and the reason I say that is I've been in the commercial real estate business for over 40 years and um, uh, during that time, and and in large part, as I've lived and uh, uh, practiced up here in North Idaho, I have uh, represented or been involved in transactions with uh, a number of the major communications, mobile communications companies. And I can tell you that uh, having uh, the type of service they need is very important. But when the acquisition people look at these sites, they look at them also from the standpoint of, is it a good real estate deal? And based upon the terms of this deal, it's a very good real estate deal from a rent standpoint from them. But moreover, it is also a good real estate deal uh, that would enable them to package this with other cell towers uh, which then gets translated and sold in the investment community. Um, that's the end game for most of these tower deals because there are real estate investment trusts out there and other groups that specialize in buying portfolios of cell towers. And to offer a cell tower in a portfolio that's this well located, convenient, it's in town, and there's no ifs or buts about it, it's a better site than if they go up to one of the other service towers that some of the appellants have uh, demonstrated are just as sufficient from a service standpoint. So I would just offer it not, and I don't want to be too cynical about that because everyone's entitled to do business. And uh, like the gentleman said, he was a born again capitalist. We all, we should all be free to conduct our business, but you really have to weigh the evidence, and again, I would just offer this perspective that really hasn't been openly discussed or shared. So thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. All right, anybody else on Zoom? Anyone else on Zoom that would like to address the board? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Shelley Hurtado. I'm at 2795 Fernand Hill Road. 
I wasn't sure if we were going to be able to speak or not, so I kind of put a big blurb in the chat column, but I, I wanted to go officially on record as being in support of this. I am in absolute opposition to a cell tower being installed on Potlatch Hill. Um, you know, it, we, we have the big tower up above um, Beauty Bay. We have the tower right down on Coeur d'Alene Lake Drive. I, I don't understand why another tower is necessary and certainly shouldn't be installed on Potlatch Hill. That is a wildfire waiting to happen. So if it is already a done deal and this is not going to be denied, the last thing I would ask is that somebody please make this thing look aesthetically pleasing because a lot of people in this town are going to be looking at it. So if it can look like a tree, like the other two towers, that would be lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on Zoom, please unmute yourself at this time. Looks like somebody on the phone. Well, that's us. Apparently, that's it. All right, so I do have one more in the audience. Amy McComley, and in favor, wishes to speak. Hi, thank you for taking my, my late response. I wasn't going to speak because I kind of felt like everybody in here kind of said everything. But the more I sat here, I just felt compelled to speak. I live in Hayden. This really doesn't affect me. But actually it does because I live in Kootenai County. I live in North Idaho and we're a community. And I'm looking around at the people in this room who I recognize. And a lot of these people don't even live in Potlatch, aren't even going to be affected. But we are affected because we care about what happens to our neighbor. It's making me so sad and sick to my stomach that as I see on Zoom, I recognize a couple names on there, that there's people there that actually are out of state right now. They live here, but they're out of state trying to celebrate a family member's wedding. And instead of being able to do that, they're on Zoom fighting this. I see a mother with her four-week-old baby who's dragging out in the, in the snow to come to this, begging for protection. I'm looking at families in here with their children instead of being at home. And it makes me sick because I feel like I look at these people who have paid their own money for attorneys to fight this when, like I think it was believe Heidi, I don't know who I think it was Heidi who said, we elected you. We elected you to protect us. And what's concerning me is we can, we can fight this one, we can maybe win this one, but we all know the times that we live in, this is just the beginning of lots of things. And so I am encouraging you obviously to vote against this, but I'm encouraging you with this kind of new administration kind of going in going forward to please do your due diligence, do your research for not just this case, but for every case, because we have elected you, because we've trusted you. And yes, it's our responsibility to show up to these meetings, but moms with four-week babies and family members trying to celebrate another state out of weddings should not have to always have to come to these meetings to make sure that you guys are looking out for our best interests and not for big corporate because big corporate is going to be this is just the beginning of them trying to come in here and take away our livelihood so thank you and i appreciate your time and i just appreciate and hope that you're going to do the right thing going forward and really do that due diligence so that we're not constantly having to fight one more thing thank you thank you Amy. Oh. Yep. All right, uh, anybody else wish to speak that did not fill out one of these? All right, so it looks like that we are moving on to the, um, I guess, call them respondent. So, all right, respondent, you have 30 minutes. control with this up and down perfect thank you um, my name I don't know Jonathan um, well let's yeah, see a little bit we can recenter it
And this PowerPoint will be entered as B1003. Can you reset the entire screen? You have to physically move that one. Oh. Yeah. So that's special. There, that's there it. Awesome. Thank you. All right, um, David. We did get uh, <laughs> we did get about a half a dozen uh, that don't wish to speak that are in favor. So can I just read the names real quick? Yes, ma'am. All right, uh, Thomas Page, Jerry, Jeremy Fuller, Leilani Fuller, Kelly Fuller, Bryce Fuller, Will Fuller, and Carolyn Fuller. All in favor? Do not wish to speak. So. All right. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Josh Leonard. I'm here. Uh, I'm from Clark Wardle, that is the name of my law firm. Uh, I'm here representing AT&T. Uh, for the record, my address is 251 East uh, Front Street, Suite 310 in Boise, zip 83701. Uh, also, uh, Debbie, Debbie Griffin of Smart Leak is, is online and is available to speak if, if issues come up. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present here today. Um, before I start, and, and I want to be, be careful about this, I, I need to object to a couple of things to, to preserve my client's rights going forward. Um, the first is the, the, that I need to object uh, to the process. Uh, it's not the board's fault. It's not staff's fault. In fact, it's nobody's fault. Uh, but this is essentially a do-over of exactly what we did before. Uh, and in that way, it, it violates my client's due process and protected property rights. Uh, my client uh, and and the applicant, Mr. Engel, own the property that we're talking about. It's there. It's it's his, and it belongs to him. Uh, and he has a vested right uh, in using that how he wants, subject to reasonable regulations. Uh, I also need to object because the something I noticed as we were going through, and I started checking off names. Uh, several of the people who were included on the uh, the request for reconsideration that was 47 people also had an opportunity, in addition to their attorney's uh, 15 minutes to speak, they each got three minutes additional to speak, uh, which far exceeded at the amount of time that we're being, being given here today to, to speak. That's out of the way. Thank you. I appreciate you indulging me. Uh, really quickly, I want to give a roadmap of where I intend to go, a quick timeline, a uh, very brief project overview. Uh, we've been here before. Uh, you've seen it. Uh, you know the project. Summary of opponent's arguments. Um, the proven significant gap in coverage. I'm going to rebut some arguments, and then I'm going to talk about the standards and, and what those are for, for wireless uh, communication facilities. Timeline, how we got here. April 18th, 2022, we submitted, it was, or it was a pre-application meeting. Uh, application submitted, staff deemed application complete. Uh, then you go down, and the board approved our application on October 27th. And I'm, I'm going to respectfully disagree with Mr. Braden. Uh, the shot clock actually continues until uh, the final decision on an application. And because reconsideration is a requirement in the state of Idaho prior to going to court, it is a, considered a final decision. Uh, and, and so uh, the county is right now uh, outside the shot clock. In fact, the shot clock, uh, minus the six days that we agreed to toll, uh, the county is at 206 days. At, at 150 days, uh, you, you are uh, you're required to give a final decision within 150 days and, and have not done that. <coughs> Project overview, really quickly. This is a close-in aerial view uh, of the site, 70 by 70 area uh, with, the, with the roadway. Uh, existing vegetation will screen the facility. There's a little bit of a change to that. I'm going to discuss that a little bit later on. Six-link or six-foot chain-link fence with privacy slats and a lock gate, and then the 150-foot tower uh, self-supported tower with a five-foot lightning rod. I'm going to refer to a slide that looks a lot like this a little bit later when we talk about setbacks. I'm going to show you that we made them. As, as our RF justification has demonstrated and will again demonstrate today, we're proposing the minimum height necessary to achieve the carrier's cover coverage objectives and to comply with Kootenai County Code. We're utilizing a lightning rod and a sophisticated grounding system to ground lightning into the earth. We have greater than required setbacks on the north and south property lines. And as I'll talk about in a moment, we meet the setbacks on the north and south property lines. Neutral color with an anti-glare finish. 
surrounded by dense, mature vegetation, and this is an unmanned passive use. There's no light, no glare, no noise, no fumes, no traffic. I say no traffic. One visit a month, maybe, by a cell tech. Compared to, say, a, uh, an event center that also takes access off of this same road, very little traffic. Summary of the opponent's arguments. I want to point out here, there have been no new arguments or evidence from opponents. In, on the left is, a, uh, is highlighting the, uh, the order of decision in which it describes what the concerns were. On the right are what those concerns are uh, here tonight and in the request for reconsideration. There w weren't any new. One thing I want to cover that isn't, isn't up here, uh, regarding the allegations against former Commissioner Filios, there has been no fact established that any of that is, is correct. And, I, and if you're going to make a decision on the basis of, of his, who he may have been employed with you know, before, I strongly recommend leaving the record open to give him the opportunity to defend himself. Uh, I don't think it's fair at all for him to have to, uh, to, have to bear uh, the allegations that he's borne tonight. Very important. Again, the opponents have provided you with no basis for reconsideration. They've made all the same arguments using the same evidence and still nothing in the record that actually supports their concern. Your decision has to be based on evidence, not concerns. They're basically just asking you to change your minds without giving you a reason to. I'm going to cover each of these arguments in a little bit. One thing I want to note before I jump into the arguments, though, is you're not here to decide whether or not to approve or deny this tower application. It's already been approved. You're here to determine and to decide whether the commission as it exists or the board as it existed back in October made an error, and if they did, to identify that error. They had the same information that you have before you, nothing new. They have the same argument, they had the same arguments that you now have before you. Recognizing that there's, uh, that two of you were there, I, I probably didn't need to say that, but uh, I, I did just for the record. Uh, we have demonstrated a proven significant gap in wireless coverage. Our propagation studies and, and coverage maps were created by experts. They've mentioned engineers, but they've had no RF engineer who actually conducted the modeling necessary to provide uh, the, the, the plots that we have. The quote at the bottom of this is important. This is where it talks about, Mr. Smeko mentioned uh, least intrusive means and uh, to, to fill the significant gap. This quote here is where Kootenai County Code addresses both of those issues, the significant gap uh, and the, uh, the least intrusive means. It says, in order to limit towers, it says, no new tower greater than 60 feet in height shall be constructed within a two mile radius of an existing tower unless engineering data demonstrates the existence of a significant network coverage gap, which would be impractical to remedy by other means. Not impossible to remedy by other means, impractical, a far lower standard. Actually, I want to go back to that one just for a moment. In their, in their written materials, and again today, the uh, opponents have argued that the only thing that's protected by the Telecommunications Act is outdoor telephone calls. Now, that's actually not correct. Uh, that is case law that was decided based on an old FCC order. The new FCC order, which almost all of which, almost all of which has been upheld by courts, there are two pieces of it that are currently on hold uh, by the DC Court of Appeals. Um, but the new one says, let's see if it's here. Cannot, cannot deny if denial would have the effect of prohibiting the prohibition of personal services. And then it says what the FCC's order clarifies what that means. We clarify that an effective prohibition occurs where a state or local legal requirement materially inhibits, not prohibits, inhibits a provider's ability to engage in any of a variety of acti activities related to its provision of a covered service. It says, not only met when filling a coverage gap, but also when densifying a wireless network. Densifying is uh, pr providing additional resources to a, 
offload from one site to another to make sure that the, everybody on that, on that tower uh, can get service. The other things are introducing new services or otherwise improving service. So why is that important? That's important because this is both a coverage site and a capacity site. The proposed new uh, wireless communication facility uh, is needed for coverage and capacity. Coverage is the need, as you can see up there, the need to expand wireless service into an area that either has no service or has, uh, we'll call it bad service, but sometimes it's just unsatisfactory service. Uh, and by that I mean it takes a second to connect or it disconnects or it, it doesn't make a call on the first try. Those are examples of, of unsatisfactory. Not that it's not there, but that it's not satisfactory. Capacity, uh, then, is the need for additional wireless resources. This is both of those. If you look, let's see, is there a laser pointer on this? Right in the center. If you look up here in blue, that's the existing AT&T site that needs to be offloaded due to growth and additional subscribers that have come up in that area. That one's overwhelmed and currently can't support itself or can't support the use of it. As a result, this one's necessary to offload that one. A couple of things I want to point out here, too. The red oval that you see is the uh, targeted service area. That's the, the area in which uh, the carrier, AT&T, is trying to provide service. The green is what existing coverage is, and the, the part that's not green is that LTE coverage gap. Here is the site that you have, and then it, within this, the rectangle, which is the, uh, the search area. The search area, the way that they design these, the search area is intended to be, if they locate a tower there, it will reach the, uh, somewhere within that, that search area, it will reach uh, the, the highest amount or the, the most number of subscribers and, and be able to, pr to fill that gap in coverage. So this shows the same map, but then now with the yellow overlay, you can see uh, in, it, it, that, it, that the proposed tower, and this is the, the, yellow, t uh, the yellow overlay is if we put a tower on the, on the red star right there. And it shows that it far exceeds existing uh, for, for that area. Uh, and, and actually expands the, the covered area out to 20.38 miles. Alternate uh, site analysis. AT&T uh, identified, uh, pursuant to, uh, to Kootenai County Code, identified 16 potential alternate candidate sites. Four of those are radio towers that aren't appropriate for, uh, for co-location. Six of them already have AT&T antennas on them, and they don't reach uh, to, pro to fill the significant gap in coverage. On one of them, if AT&T were to put its, its antenna on it, it would cause an interference or, a, or uh, it, it would actually knock down the existing uh, signal and make it worse than, it, than if it weren't there at all. And that leaves five potential alternate, alternate site candidates to examine to see whether they would fit uh, and provide meaningful uh, change. This is number two. One of the things I want to address here, uh, Mr. Smanko said that these are, these are just uh, projections or, or these are just um, not based on data or that, they, that we're not showing you the data. These are not, not just uh, projections. These are what are called detailed, oh, what's the term? I just lost it. Finely tuned modeling software that uses 10 different sites or, or 10 different sources of data to determine what, uh, where AT&T needs better coverage. One of those is drop calls. One of those is where they're having, uh, where their uh, phone is pinging. Uh, a phone is constantly talking to the network. And as it's pinging these resources, if it comes back and says, okay, we've got a good connection, it's using that. It's using it if it comes back and says it's not a good connection. They take all of that information and plug it into a model that accounts for not just topography and not just atmospheric uh, conditions, but also for what they call ground clutter. Trees, buildings, cars, all of these things are taken into account with these models. They're highly scientific and they're based on hard data. Here you can see 
uh, alternate location number two, let's see if I can laser it again, is right here. If we were to put a, 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 an AT&T antenna here, it would cover only the parts in red. That's it. Only the, the portions in red. The tower here would cover the parts in red and the parts in blue. All of that together. It, the red and it, it's a little bit confusing uh, and part of the reason why we don't have RF engineers come to speak in public forums because they, they make it a little bit confusing. But the entire area, red and blue, would be provided coverage by this site. This site would only provide to the red areas. Next one. Oh, really quickly, I want to hit this too. This would only cover 14.75% of the targeted service area versus 100% uh, of the subscribers within the targeted service area if we use the, the uh, proposed. And I shouldn't say proposed. I should say approved tower. Uh, it's no longer just a pr uh, proposed. It's actually approved. Next one, site number four. Again, we're jumping number three because it's one of those that didn't qualify. Site number four would only cover 10.51% of the targeted service area, the area that coverage is needed. Next one, 12.54% of the, of the targeted service area is the, is the only improvement that we would get from there. Here are the two, big, the two biggest of the uh, alternate uh, sites. The first is 52.5% and the next is 52.3%. The best we could do from these other sites is only 50% of the targeted service area, leaving a gap, a substantial gap in coverage of near, very nearly 50% of the area identified. Again, coverage achieved by each of the alternatives. And again, they skip around a little bit because the other ones uh, were not uh, we're not qualified for other reasons. But of these, the very best they do is, is only around 50% uh, filling of that, of that sig significant gap in coverage. Uh, I also need to talk a little bit about Ms. De 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 Chancic, DeSantic's uh, maps. I actually don't know what she was outlining on those. We tried to figure it out and couldn't figure out what she was outlining because they, they do, what she did do look very similar. You can see here though, the coverage area that, that is uh, based on these detailed modeling or these, uh, these model, this modeling software is very different uh, from, uh, from what, what her, uh, her, her pictures showed or from uh, her, I guess it was tracing or, or using her eye to figure out where those, those different coverage areas were. Um, I wasn't exactly sure. So one of, the ex one of the things that came up at the uh, last hearing and, and, and again in the request for reconsideration, why did the hearing examiner recommend denial? The first one's important because a lot of the, the things that the hearing examiner uh, quoted, a lot of the statements that she quoted were from the comprehensive plan instead of the zoning ordinance, elevating the comprehensive plan over the zoning ordinance. The zoning ordinance is, is where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. It's what governs what happens on property. The comprehensive plan is an aspirational document. What's interesting, though, and it was mentioned before the last hearing, her quotes to the uh, comprehensive plan were to the wrong comprehensive plan. Uh, she also gave too much weight to unsupported concerns. The, I italicized unsupported there because concerns are not evidence. Evidence is data. Evidence is something produced by experts. Evidence is uh, a, an example of what's going to happen. Uh, she also exceeded her authority by imposing much higher standards than what's required in Kootenai County Code, and she gave no weight to the RF engineers' coverage maps. A couple of quotes that uh, I put down here at the bottom from the hearing examiner's uh, recommendation of denial are examples of the standards that, were, that, sh that she imposed uh, in in recommending denial that aren't found anywhere in, in state code, federal code, uh, city code, county code, anywhere. She's, she was requiring us to have the most effective and most appropriate locations. Most effective, we've demonstrated. We have that, the most effective location. Most appropriate is very subjective. Most appropriate is very subjective. And really, the only way to control what happens on real property and I said it at the beginning, is to own it. Really, that's the only way to do it. 
in this case, uh, as far as appropriate locations, we have a zoning code. If we comply with the terms of the zoning code, our application is entitled to approval. In a little bit, I'm going to talk about why, uh, why it was appropriate to, to approve our, our application and, and issue the, the conditional use permit. Uh, the next objection was Potlatch Road. Something I've heard a couple of times at this hearing and, and, and a lot at the past hearing that was in writing was that, that Potlatch Road is, is substandard. Uh, pr that, that's an issue, and we even heard somebody testify about it today. That's an issue that will be resolved at the building permit stage. Either it meets the standards or it doesn't. It's objective. We know what it is. When we submit building permits, if the highway district says you need to do X, in order to, to pull a building permit on this, then the, the tower company has to pull in it, or, or the, uh, the wireless carrier has to do X. Uh, it, it's just how it works. Uh, something to, to note, the, the, all of the agencies that were notified either, uh, say, either said that they approved the project or that they didn't object to the project going forward. There were, there were none that said, no, we can't do this. I'd also note that the road and access, as I mentioned, is within the East Side Highway District's jurisdiction. They'll make that decision. Uh, let's see what else. Where am I? The site will not generate. Oh, that's right. This is, and then no vehicular traffic. Uh, one time a month uh, for maintenance and inspections. Fire. As we mentioned, a lightning rod, a sophisticated grounding system, uh, not just at the base of the tower and at the foundation of the, the two equipment items, but at all fence posts. And then an earth ground system, apart from the basalt. I don't know, I can make public comment. Will also be installed around the entire fence lease area. Uh, and then the Kootenai County Fire and Rescue appro approved the, uh, the proposal with no conditions. Something I want to mention about that, though. There were no conditions, but then the board adopted a condition that said we needed to comply with fire smart. Uh, I, we, we prepared a plan and went back uh, and presented a fire smart plan and, and it's since been approved. Here's the approved fire smart plan. A lean, green, and clean area that's required 30 feet around all structures. A 100 foot defensible space required. 100 feet, uh, that includes no dead vegetation left on the ground, that pruning tree limbs up to 10 feet or whichever is lesser, up to 30 to 50% of the tree height. Uh, dispose of slash, control noxious weeds, clean accumulated leaves and needles, and maintain these things on an annual basis immediately prior to fire season. That in and of itself makes the property, which everybody has already said hasn't been maintained for fire purposes in a long time, safer from the fire risk. All service vehicles, construction vehicles that visit must have a portable fire extinguisher. We're required to have an approved turnaround. We're, uh, and then we're also required to prune and maintain vegetation over the access roadway. Visual impact mitigated. I'm going to refer you back to the last, uh, the last presentation that I gave. I, I will say this, though, today. We went above and beyond with our visual studies. Originally, uh, as required by county code, we submitted visual studies. Move those off there. We submitted visual studies from four vantage points, one from each direction. During the August 4th, 2022 public hearing, several people made unfounded statements that they were fake or photoshopped. So you know what we did? We took their, where they wanted us to take, uh, take pictures from and hired an independent uh, contractor to go and raise a balloon the height of the tower and then to take pictures and then put a tower up to that height. Uh, and, and, and show us what those were. They, they provided 11 additional views. That wasn't us. That, that was an, uh, an independent person who signed the, their affidavit that's in the record, saying it was true. Um, four of those 11, it were the tower was visible from those, those vantage points. And then seven, from seven of those, the tower was not visible. And those slides are in the record, and I'd ask you to go, to go back and review those before making your decision. And again, the locations for those balloon tests were uh, taken from public comments during the uh, August 4th hearing. I also pointed out, and, and it, 
drew some derision from the crowd, as a couple of things that I've stated today have. But I also pointed out that in two of the photos, two of the vantage points, although the tower wasn't visible, there were very large public infrastructure uh, items visible in the foreground of the, of the vantage point. In one instance, it was a double, uh, double pole power line that ran along a road. Um, it, it's just part of living where we do and doing what we do as, as people. These are infrastructure projects. Uh, the other one was a large light pole uh, that, that obstructed the view of the lake from the road. I also want to note that the standard uh, in county code isn't perfectly blends in. It's best blends into the surrounding area. You've got to consider that when the board that adopted the zoning code said it needs to blend in or it needs to best blend in, they know what cell towers look like. They knew back then what cell towers looked like. They're not beautiful objects of art. They, uh, they are what they are. They're infrastructure. Uh, best blend in means to the best degree what they knew to be infrastructure would blend into the natural, the, the natural look or the natural area. A couple of other arguments. AT&T's written rebuttal. A lot of people uh, complained that they didn't get a chance to respond and rebut the rebuttal. Uh, unfortunately, that's not how it works. The applicant in these, just like today, the applicant will get the last word. Uh, that's how it works. That the engineer, there was some comment about the engineer waiving liability for plans. There's a, there's a little stamp that they put on the bottom of their site plan that says that they're not to be held liable for It's because they're not construction plans. It's because they are truly just a site plan for demonstrative purposes only. When the construction plans come in, they're absolutely liable for mistakes on that. Setbacks 150, I'll come back to that. Only two people testified in favor of the CUP. The land use and zoning process, and uh, if you don't know this already, you'll, you'll, you'll learn it really quickly uh, as a new member of the commission if you haven't been on a planning. It's not a popularity contest. It's not an opportunity to win friends and influence people. It's tough. Uh, it's also not a democratic process. It really isn't. It's, we have standards. You apply the standards, and if we meet the standards, we get a, we get a permit, we get approved. There's a, a significant and growing line of case law uh, that says specifically that the number of people who testify either in favor or against uh, a zoning matter doesn't matter. Decisions are to be made by applying the facts to the, the adopted standards. The last thing down the bottom there, the NEPA. Uh, at least a couple of opponents have demanded that a NEPA or, or that an environmental impact statement would uh, resolve all the problems because it would get denied. Uh, a NEPA, uh, an environmental impact statement, is required. It's the National Environmental Policy Act. It's done at the national level. It's done by the federal government. The, t the, the company that builds a tower before they're allowed to build the tower, after they get this approval, approval goes and submits uh, a historic, they have to submit a, a historic survey of the area. They have to do an uh, environmental study. They have to do all of the things that have been asked for. It's just not required by the county's code. And it's not within the county's purview. It's the federal government that does that, and it's necessary uh, to submit it there. OK, now setbacks. Complies with setbacks, actually. And I'll tell you why. The top. All WCFs shall be set back at least 150 feet from the boundary of any parcel. So what is a WCF? What, what fits within that definition? We look at the definitions in code. It says WCFs, WCFs include siding areas, transmission towers, and antennas. Transmission towers and antennas are the same thing in this instance. The, the antennas come off the, off the tower. Siding areas, though. I was surprised. Whoever wrote your code did an excellent job. The definitions are amazing. <laughs> Siding area is defined. It includes that portion of a par parcel that contains, first, the transmission tower. And then it says, and related buildings and equipment required for the operation of a wireless communication facility. Required for the operation of a wireless communication facility. That is not a fence. I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. Tower is here in the green. Equipment is here and here. This is a, uh, a they call it a, a a WIC shelter, it's where the, the networking gear goes. This is a uh, generator that sits on cement. This is equipment that's necessary. Actually, the generator probably isn't technically necessary, but they like to have it there and they need to have it there in case there's an, an emergency and they can, they can power up the, the, the site using that. This box right here, the blue box, 
is what's referred to when they talk about the related buildings and equipment that's required for the operation of a wireless communication facility. Okay. Uh, th this next, when I click to the next slide, I'm gonna I'm gonna recommend that you use this as your frame of reference, and I'll show you why. This use this these two structures right here, and I'll I'll point out on the next slide where those are because to get the setbacks for the whole parcel, I need to zoom out quite a ways. Here we go. The outline of the parcel. Here's the the fence right here. Here are those two items right here. This is the uh, setback to the tower. This is the setback to the tower from this side. Both meet. If you take these, this side of the equipment and this side of the equipment and slide it across, we are still 150.2 feet. It's close. It's close. But we meet it. We meet that setback. Do the same over here. The numbers here are because I never had a math teacher that didn't say show, my work, show your work uh, so that you can check it. I'm going to close just really quick. If I can have 15, 20 seconds. Everybody else got three minutes plus their 15. Pat? That's within your prerogative. I, I don't think it will be unreasonable given all the time that was um, afforded to the people, the appellants. All right. And, and you know, in, in return, I think, you know, you can, you know, make some indulgence with the rebuttal as well. Go ahead, finish. Thank you very much. Um, within, <laughs> he's heard me speak before. He knows I could go on for a while. I'll be quick, I promise. Uh, speaking of Mr. Semenko, he gave you the standard today uh, for if we end up, uh, it's under the Telecom Act, for if this matter ends up in federal court. But that's not the standard here tonight. Again, the standard here tonight is whether the board, when it made its decision back on the 6th of October, made an error. Tonight, we don't believe that the, uh, the people that have requested reconsideration have given you any new basis to, rec to, to find an error on the part of the board. The same information, the same concerns, uh, the, sa the same testimony, and the same reasons. Uh, we ask you to, de to deny the request for reconsideration uh, and allow our, uh, your approval of our tower to stand. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, we need 10 minutes. All right, so 10-minute break. Um, come back at 8.30. Madam Chair? Yes. We did have a request through Zoom from Heather Greenman okay. asking that her name be included. And I, it was unclear in the chat box if she actually wanted to speak. Okay. But I told her in the chat box that I'd bring up that she, that she wanted her name included in this. Opposed, does not um, wish to speak? That's my understanding. Well, I don't know. We might okay. ask when you get back if she wants to speak. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. She just said she would like to speak in the chat box. Yeah. All it.
Yes. So. All right. Let me, okay. All right, Jonathan's good. Jennifer, you good? All right, folks, thank you very much uh, for getting back on time. I have uh, two who are neutral and do not wish to speak, and that would be, looks like maybe Werner Krimples and Connie Krimples. Still don't wish to speak, okay. And now we will go to opposed and um, wishes to speak. So we've got Ingrid Cassell, opposed, may wish to speak. Ingrid, are you still here? No, angry. Okay. Natalie, oh boy. Um, Keir, queer guard? Q guard? Natalie? Guard. Opposed? <coughs> okay, not here. David Anderson, opposed, does not wish to speak. He marked the wrong box. He marked the wrong box. Oh, all right. She wasn't here when you made the. Oh, the announcement. Okay, and then um, Tanya Osterson, opposed, does not wish to speak. She also marked it wrong. They're both with wire item. Okay, and Sandra S. Hall, opposed. She is opposed and has already left. Okay. She's marked herself opposed. I mean, she's opposed to the tower. Okay, so she's in favor as well. She's in favor of this. Okay, so do we have anybody to speak in favor? I'm sorry. Well, yes. <laughs> now I'm getting confused. Okay, anybody to speak in opposition to the reconsideration, so who supports the CUP um, approval? All right, on Zoom? On Zoom, I posted a chat notice and on, to ask that, and no one responded. Okay. But there is still Heather Greenman that asked to speak, if you will allow it, in opposition. Yes. In, um, in opposition to the tower. So okay. so in favor of the reconsideration? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, I am fine with that. Heather, unmute yourself and go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I apologize for not being there. I had a surgery and so I'm uh, at home for the next month recovering. Um, I want to thank you all for your service. And congratulations to the uh, new members of the board. Um, I, I do want to speak in opposition of the 5G, so I guess I am uh, in approval of the reconsideration. Um, I, uh, well, I just have a little story to share. Um, in uh, 2020, I took an experimental vaccine uh, that was said uh, that it, it was safe, and uh, I, I researched it. And the um, scientific studies on it look like it should be safe because it was mRNA, and mRNA is not supposed to make a DNA. DNA makes mRNA. Uh, when I took that experimental vaccine, I had a reaction to that vaccine. It was a semi-paralytic event. Um, it lasted a half a day. And then um, I developed nerve problems as my foot was in a wheelchair for three months outside of work. I actually had to quit my job because I couldn't get my foot to heal. And um, now uh, my husband and I have been trying to conceive for over about a year and a half. And we've had problems conceiving. Um, there's a study came out recently about the Pfizer vaccine. 80% uh, of women have had problems with conception or spontaneous miscarriage. Uh, thank God I've been able to receive treatment through Heart of Hope Health, and they have actually been able to help me with a lot of my issues. Um, but uh, when I look up the um, 5G, it says that it's actually been introduced in 2000, um, 2019. That's not a lot of time to actually study the effects that those levels of radiation can have upon people. Um, I understand that uh, it said that it's, it's low level but it's not a lot of time to actually study the effects of that, just like uh, vaccines normally take seven to nine years to really understand that. So I think uh, when we're dealing with things that actually could very much affect uh, people's health, especially in Idaho, because if you know anything about Idaho, 
especially this parts of Idaho, we actually have higher levels of radiation. Uh, that's why when you buy a house, uh, sometimes uh, houses will be required to have uh, more fans um, underneath in the crawl space because of the radiation. I think it'd be best to uh, hold off on this until there are more studies that are done um, because it is something that could affect people's health, even if it's said that it's safe. Uh, we found out that sometimes things are said safe and it doesn't end up being safe. And if it can affect people's health, uh, it's best that we hold off on that. So I, that's what I would like to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, so then, Pat, um, point of order, since we have one more in favor, should we give a mm -hmm. minute to uh, rebuttal? To, uh, well, to, to the, I'm sorry, not rebuttal, but the respondent. I think it would be appropriate to offer that to the respondent. Yeah. Okay. Would you like 60 seconds to respond? Yes, correct. That's very gracious. I appreciate the opportunity, but um, because it was mostly about health, I don't need to respond. Okay, thank you. All right, anybody else wishing to testify? All right, so now it is time. I'm sorry. Oh. I'll make this quick. I'm Bill Ludko, 2916 East Fernand Hill Road in Gordon Lane. I was trying to figure out the spin on your diagram. I think I might have done it. So when he's got the oval, if you look at probably two-thirds of it, it's to the east, and that's all woods, and there's no people. But they picked that area because they wanted that to be 100% coverage, but it's not needed. So when they've got the tower that was up here that did a 12% <clears throat> and one here that did 14, it's because it couldn't get to where we don't need it. And the one that had the 50% or 60% is where we need it. And it's the other tower that's existing. Because we want to, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to have coverage where the people are. We don't, I mean, God bless Bambi and all those guys, but we don't need the coverage out there. But by setting up that, that, uh, that coverage area, that's how they're getting away with this. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Once again, um, one minute to respond. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair, members of the commission. I'll just be really quick. Uh, AT&T doesn't make money by putting towers where they're not needed. Uh, it's, a, it's an expense item, not a profit item. For them to put this tower up, they're they're not targeting it to areas that aren't necessary that, that service isn't needed. They're targeting it targeting it to fit within and fill a significant gap in coverage. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, so for the rebuttal, are we doing uh, three five minutes or? We're going to do two pieces. Okay. So. We're, we'll just use the fifteen minutes. Up okay. Sounds good. Thank you. That's all right. Yes, so 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Madam Chair, Commissioners, um, thanks. It's been a long evening, and we certainly appreciate your attention. Uh, I first wanted to address the process concern that was raised by the attorney for AT&T about a do-over. Um, Title 8, Article 8.5, Section 8.8. 8 .505 of your code says that this proceeding, reconsideration, is a de novo proceeding. That's in your code, which means doing it anew from the beginning. So it, it is a do-over. It's in your code. Um, secondly, I wanted to address the issue about whether the uh, maps are just projections or not. Um, AT&T provided during the initial hearing process um, its RF justification uh, that was submitted by Kung Ling Brian Lin, who's from Issaquah, Washington, works for AT&T. And uh, in his document that he provided in justification, uh, projected new coverage. It's a projection. Projected new AT&T coverage identifies the projected coverage, I'm quoting from his report. So they are, they are project, projections. Um, 
to, quote, predict coverage. Uh, it's not based on data. It's projections from a computer model. All right, let's talk about the setback real quick. <coughs> Council went through a few definitions. He didn't go far enough down, though. He, he cited the siting area definition that includes the transmission tower and related buildings and equipment. But there's also a definition of building, and it says see definition of structure. And the definition of structure at 8.9.403 says that which is built or constructed artificially built up, includes structures for which a building permit is required, instructions exempt from a building permit. From the dictionary, a fence is a structure that encloses an area. The fence is necessary. You, you heard, and it wasn't uh, dealt with in the response, that in the requirements under 8.5.132, for a wireless communication facility under, let's see, standards B6, landscape, so it would be 8.5.132, B6B, a chain link fence no less than six feet in height from the finished grade shall, that's mandatory, it says right at the beginning of your code, shall be constructed around each siting area. It is a necessary part, and they've admitted that they are closer than 150 feet from that fence to the next property over. That is in violation of the um, requirements for setback. There's no other way to look at it. It's something that was missed along the way, apparently, but uh, that's one of the reasons why we have rehearing, reconsideration to identify errors like that. So my speech teacher at Lakeland, Mr. Gorton, who's passed away, he, he would always start his speech classes by telling people, because they hated being there, why it's important to be in speech class. He says, there is going to be at least one time in your life when you have to get up in front of somebody, it'll be very important for you to explain to them why you need something or why something needs to happen whether it's getting a loan or in front of somebody that's making a decision that's going to impact you. And I think the folks that testified tonight um, demonstrated why, why that's important, and they did a nice job tonight. I would sum up the public comment as this comes down to what AT&T wants, their business plan, what they want to do. And I don't uh, begrudge them for trotting their business plan out and wanting to do certain things. But it's that versus what the public needs in terms of wireless communication services. It's not the Federal Cell Tower Proliferation Act. It's the Federal Telecommunications Act, what's necessary to provide telecommunication services. And you have a smart ordinance that's incorporated that stuff into the ordinance to determine what's needed. These words are in your code. It's not just the provisions that council cited, they're, they're laced all through your code. So, summing up here, there's no proven significant gap in coverage. The only data in the record, which Alyssa provided, and I didn't hear it rebutted, it's hard to rebut those screenshots that show you've got full signal, uh, that's it. There has been no data provided. It's these maps and, and things that don't... Uh, Maybe they're based on data. We don't know because the data wasn't provided. Also, it's not been proven that this is the least intrusive means of closing the gap. Again, look at our exhibit. A lot of these provide, in the last public testimony, basically provide the same kind of coverage, even if there's a proven gap in coverage, which, again, it's not been proven. I want to talk about um, these projection maps a little more. Um, it's the obligation of the applicant to prove with substantial written probative evidence in the record if a significant gap exists. Even FCC staff have rejected the wireless industry's 
self-serving, unverifiable coverage maps and did their own testing. FCC staff completed 10,000 miles of drive testing. Staff conducted 24,000 tests in nine states. The FCC staff found propagation maps that were submitted, the same kind of maps you've got here, were submitted by companies like Verizon, AT&T, et cetera, are inaccurate. In fact, the accuracy of those computer-generated propagation maps range from as low as 16.2% to a maximum of 64%. Therefore, FCC staff advised that the FCC should no longer accept computer-generated propagation maps without hard data. Show me the data that backs this up. And for the same reason, they found that local governments are now saying, don't give us these propagation maps without the hard data. Your code requires data. It's in the code. The appropriate engineering data, that's the language in the code. The, cap the applicants failed to give a propagation map backed up by verifiable hard data. That's a finding the county commissioners can make to grant this request for reconsideration and deny the conditional use permit. I alluded to earlier a uh, decision in Ada County, and the same kind of finding was made in Ada County. And I'm going to read that to you so that you've, you've got it on the record here as an example, not just the FCC or some faraway state, but another jurisdiction, a fellow board here in Idaho. The board finds that the applicant has not demonstrated in enough detail why the proposed facility cannot be accommodated on an existing tower. In addition, the applicant failed to demonstrate a significant gap in coverage exists in the area which would necessitate the proposed facility. The evidence provided did not show that the applicant had a significant gap in coverage. This will sound familiar. The board finds that a map, testimony, and written analysis was provided, but the applicant failed to justify why an existing tower cannot accommodate the proposed facility, nor did the applicant justify that a significant gap in coverage existed warning the proposed tower. In the decision that was made by the previous um, county commission, um, there's very scant findings on this, but I'm going to go over them with you just real quickly. Um, Chairman Filios in the deliberations, uh, this is from the written decision on page 13, said that the applicant had provided all the information necessary to support its request. Clearly, the applicant is not. No data has been provided, just these projections. Um, Commissioner Brooks was right on point when he said everyone in the community depends on cellular coverage. While that's true, that's not data. That doesn't justify this tower at this location to serve uh, a gap in coverage that has not been demonstrated with data. Commissioner Duncan said that the request did not adequately address site constraints or hazards. You've heard about the fire hazards tonight. They have not been avoided or mitigated. No water is available to put out a fire. It doesn't matter if it's a cell tower, a box store, a dog house, whatever you build out there, you're not going to be able to put out a fire. You need to recognize the site constraints that cannot be avoided or mitigated at this particular site. You don't say, oh, well, these, these conditions exist. We can't do anything about them, so go ahead and build. It doesn't make it OK to increase the risk. You have to recognize, and one of the criteria in the code requires you to recognize, as Commissioner Duncan said previously, that you have to look at the constraints, the site constraints. Commissioner Duncan also said the applicant could have done more due diligence, including a more exhaustive search of other sites in the area. We've demonstrated that tonight. And then finally, the applicant had failed to demonstrate that additional cellular coverage was necessary. That's exactly right. That was in the deliberations. In the findings, in the board analysis, I should say, it says the applicant did submit sufficient evidence showing that it completed an exhaustive search which unambag unambiguously concluded that the subject property is the only feasible site to address the sizable gap in cellular coverage and capacity which currently exists in the area. There's no finding or analysis that such a gap existed. It just assumed that it was there. The word proven sizable gap. Say that it's been proven. It's not in there. 
So what do you do at this point with all of this? What's the error? Mr. Braden said under 67, 65, 35 of Idaho Code, you have to determine how the relevant decision criteria are met or not met. So boiling it down, the applicable requirements have not been met. There are requirements in the application requirements that require data that was not provided. The proposal is not compatible with existing business homes and neighborhoods, if you've heard. It does not adequately address site constraints or hazards and adequately mitigate fire. We just heard about that. Services and facilities are not available. Where's the water to put out a fire? So those are the kinds of findings that you can make. Um, we believe that reconsideration should be granted. I'm going to turn over the last couple of minutes to Alyssa, and she's going to sum up. Thank you. OK, two minutes. I'll go fast. Um, we gave the county throughout this process hundreds of pages of research, dozens of links to scientific studies, legal cases, and real-world local examples showing important and easily repeatable data. Only two people were in favor all along. Tonight, obviously, fewer than that. Um, and throughout all of these months, um, I just wanted to note that it's sort of sad that with few exceptions, other than um, you, Commissioner Duncan, and Examiner Woodward, um, we have been chastised, dis dismissed. Uh, we've been told to be respectful in the, in the face of disrespect and lies. We've been called crazy, we've been hung up on, and we've been ignored. I moved my family here from another state three years ago because that place had become dangerous and because public officials actively shut down any discourse until there was no use saying anything at all. I believe that this beautiful place would be different, that that dialogue would happen, especially on difficult topics, that we together could do what it really takes to hear and protect one another. Also, I'm a tech company business owner who depends on low latency streaming services for at least one of our products, so I understand the need for tech. Here's the thing, though. I don't care who you are. You don't put lives at risk to further your business goals, period. The bottom line is facts matter and the law matters. As mentioned, the applicant did not give the county the required scientific data to prove a significant gap in coverage or the least intrusive means, and we thoroughly proved the opposite to be true. Also, science matters, and hopefully our lives do, too. We prove that a tower in this location will increase the odds of a lightning strike on Potlatch Hill by up to 600 times. We've shown how quickly 125 homes and hundreds of lives will be in jeopardy should one small spark ignite that overgrown property that lies at the bottom of our neighborhood. There's one way off that steep hill. There's almost zero water. Large emergency vehicles cannot drive down that dirt road, and a raging wildfire would cover Potlatch Hill in just minutes. I'm sad that we had to get to this point, but here we are, so I'll make one last request. Please, when you make your decision, I ask you respectfully, follow the facts, the county's own rules, federal law, the proven science, and please act to protect the health and safety of the citizens of Potlatch Hill. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, I would, anybody else? Just call it one more time, okay. Then what I'd like to do then is ask for a motion to end deliberations and to, I'm sorry, end public testimony and uh, scheduled deliberations for January 6th at 10 a.m. 26, I don't know why I keep saying the 6th, the 26th. January 26th, yeah. Um, yeah, and public testimony and then uh, handle deliberations on the 26th. I make a motion to end public testimony and enter in deliberations where a decision will be made on January 26th at 10 a.m. I second the motion. Bill Brooks. Aye. Commissioner Matari. Aye. Chair Duncan. Aye. All right. Thank you, folks. This meeting's adjourned.